That's fine, I'm not trying to say. That's your first right. Yes. Good. Good evening and welcome back to Boat Break Science Week for our last presentation of the week. And it was by Dr. Adam Tierney, who's one of our newest recruits to the Department of Psychological Sciences. Adam did his undergraduate in Indiana University before moving to UCSD, University of California, San Diego, to do his PhD. He then did a postdoc at Northwestern University before getting a lectureship and coming to London. And Adam's title is the speech song illusion, so I'm going to leave it to Adam to explain what that's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Adam, and I've been at Birkbeck for about a year now, so I have not yet gotten around to naming the lab that I had. So if you have any suggestions, just email me and I will consider them, and uh, any of yours will show up there uh, next year. Um, but so uh, one of the things I do as a scientist is I try to research music from a scientific perspective, and specifically from the perspective of a biologist and a psychological scientist. And um, that's a, that can be kind of a uniquely challenging project. Uh, and one of the reasons why that can be challenging is that um, some of these sort of basic foundational questions about music have not really been answered. There aren't really, there's not really any consensus about basic things such as what music is, for example, which you think would be a precondition for studying it. Um, but if you look um, both around the world and also even just within Western culture, the sort of things that people are willing to describe as music, um, they're really incredibly variable. And if you're trying to put together sort of a grand unified theory of music, that theory would need to apply both to something like this. And honestly, most psychological research on music has been on things like that. Um, but a lot of people will listen to music that's not like that. It might be something more like this. Uh, so this is um, music done by an electronic group known as Matmos, and their most recent album is uh, splicing together sounds that a washing machine makes, and it sounds like this. <coughs> Alright, so if that's not your taste, um, you might sort of want to respond, well, that's, that's not really music anyway, but as as a researcher, you don't really have um, you don't really have that recourse. If you're studying people's behavior and the behavior that they think of as musical, uh, you really need to sort of study it all as a whole if you're trying to figure that it, figure out how it works. Um, so that's one difficulty: is that uh, there's there's no real consensus about how to draw a boundary over um, around what is music, uh, which which makes it hard to study. Um, the other difficulty is that it's not even clear why music exists in the first place. And that might seem initially sort of an odd question to ask, because as a potentially a musician or as a listener, you might have a feeling that music is just intrinsically rewarding. You listen to it because it feels good, and you play music because it feels good. Um, and you know, as a human, you don't really need any more explanation than that. But as a scientist and a psychologist, uh, you need to go one step further and think about why it feels good in the first place. And that's really quite puzzling, because on the face of it, it would seem to be a quite useless activity. If you, if you look at someone who's listening to music, they're just sort of sitting still, listening to relatively abstract sounds, and, and maybe kind of moving along rhythmically, uh, which would not seem to be a very useful thing to do. So if you think of sort of an alien anthropologist looking at humans and trying to figure them out, I feel like listening to music would be one of the most puzzling things to this um, theoretical alien. Um, but despite the fact that it seems that there's no obvious utility to doing it, people spend an enormous amount of time doing it. So apparently the average person in the UK, and I found out looking this up today, listens to music for four hours a day, which is an enormously long time, and actually much more than I do, to be honest. And uh, I, I don't see how people manage to fit that and the average four hours of TV in a day. Um, but So people spend a huge amount of time and resources doing this thing, which seems completely useless. Um, so why is that? And this has been puzzling people, actually, for a very long time. And even Darwin wrote about it. 
Uh, and he said that as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes are faculties of the least use to man in reference to his daily habits of life, they must be ranked amongst the most mysterious with which he is endowed. Uh, and I agree with him, this is something that's always kind of driven me nuts. And even as a music listener, even when I'm enjoying music, I'm always in the back of my mind thinking, why am I enjoying this? Uh, and not only do people spend a lot of time doing this, but it's actually extremely widespread. So although there's a lot of variability across cultures and what people call music and the sort of musical things they do, there always seems to be something that without much stretch you can describe as musical. Um, and also, it's something that people seem to be, have been doing for a very long time. Um, it's hard to get exact information on this, but um, as, I'll, as I'll say now, there's a little bit of evidence in terms of how long people might have been doing this. So next, I'm going to try to take music and put it in its approximate place in human evolutionary history, although it's, it's going to be very approximate. Um, okay, so let's place it in the context of some other things that humans do when they might have evolved. Um, so what about speech? Speech is obviously a very human activity. Uh, it's one of the things, um, speech and language, one of the things that make us human. And it's obviously then been around for a long time. And um, there's a lot of debate about what exactly that might have been. So here's just uh, one random example of a possibility. Uh, this is data from 1998, which suggests that speech might have been around for as long as 400,000 years. And the evidence for that is there's this thing called a hypoglossal canal. And uh, that is the canal that the nerves which innervate the tongue run through. And they expanded at some point in the evolution of humans, uh, suggesting that all of a sudden humans needed to do their tongue, use their tongues to uh, um, make very rapid, precise movements. So that suggests they needed to do that probably because speech had evolved. And this expansion had already taken place in early humans of around 400,000 years ago. So speech is quite old. And it was certainly the um, target of evolutionary adaptation. It's an important skill that's been around for a very long time. So by way of comparison, let's brief, briefly look at another very human skill, which is reading. Uh, so reading is, despite the fact that it's uh, also very useful, it's much more recent. And in the historical record, writing shows up for the first time around 5,000 years ago in tablets like this. So this is a cuneiform tablet from Mesopotamia. And 5,000 years is obviously, it might, it might seem like a very long time to you, but in the context of the evolution of humans, it's extremely recent. And this is so recent that probably there's been no time for humans to evolve any mechanisms that are devoted to reading. So unlike speech, reading is more of a technology than adaptation. Um, so on the one hand, we have uh, reading, which is a technology, which is very recent. And we have speech, which is an adaptation, and which is comparatively ancient. So where does music fall? Uh, well, surprisingly, music seems to be actually much older than reading, even though, again, it seems so useless. Uh, so there, there is, they, people have been finding musical instruments in cave systems that seem to be uh, quite a bit older than the oldest uh, tablets with cuneiform on them. So here is an example of, at the moment, the oldest known musical instrument. This is a bone flute that was found in a cave in Germany, and radiocarbon data suggests that it's 40,000 years old. Um, now probably, if this is actually a musical instrument, music itself is probably even older than that, because I think we can assume that early humans were uh, producing music by singing before they were actually constructing musical instruments. Okay, so music seems to fall somewhere in between speech and reading. So it's an open question whether it might be an adaptation or a technology. And this is something that people have been arguing about for a very long time, and they're probably not going to stop anywhere soon. And again, this is something that Darwin wrote about. And he not only saw music potentially as an adaptation, but he also drew attention to a very, what he saw as a very deep connection between music and speech. So um, here's what he said. When vivid emotions are felt and expressed by the orator, or even in common speech, musical cadences and rhythm are instinctively used. All these facts with respect to music and impassioned speech become intelligible to a certain extent if we may assume that musical tones and rhythm were used by our half-human ancestors during the season of courtship. We may go even further than this, and as remarked in a former chapter, believe that musical sounds afforded one of the bases for the development of language. Uh, so Darwin's saying two main things here. The first is that music might exist because it might be the, have been the target of sexual selection. So music might have been, for early humans, uh, it might have played a function in something like the peacock's tail, where the peacock's tail is not itself of direct use. And in fact, 
uh, is actually a hindrance to the peacock itself, but it's the peacock showing off to mates and saying, I'm so fit that I can afford this ridiculous tail and still get along with my daily life. Uh, similarly, music would be humans saying, I'm very clever and I can spend a lot of time learning this extremely useless skill. Um, now, Darwin's also saying the second thing, which is that he heard these very close similarities between language and music, and this suggested to him that language might have actually emerged from music, that, music might, that the proto-language might have been more musical than linguistic, and, the language, and language might have evolved from that. There was another evolutionary thinker who was contemporary of Darwin, who also pointed out this deep connection that he heard between music and language, although he put sort of a different spin on it. So this is Herbert Spencer, the philosopher, and he said that all speech is compounded of two elements, the words and the tones in which they are uttered. Music has the indirect effect of developing this language of the emotions. Music, having its root in emotional language and gradually evolving from it, has ever been reacting upon it and further advancing it. So Spencer also uh, heard and um, proposed this deep relationship between language and music, but that suggested for him the opposite of what Darwin proposed, which is that maybe language came first, and then music evolved from that by sort of abstracting out the musical qualities of speech uh, and then presenting that by itself. All right, so at the time, these ideas were impossible to test. Uh, and in fact, these ideas were quite popular, uh, this idea of this connection between language and music, and to a lesser extent, the idea that music might have evolved at all. Uh, that's not been very popular in the history of psychology as a whole, really, since these, um, these two thinkers wrote. And that's for a number of reasons. But one of those reasons, I think, is simply that linguists and music theorists are quite territorial. Uh, and so anyone trying to build bridges between those two, two domains uh, has that as an ob obstacle relief from the get-go. Um, but as I say, recently there has been renewed interest into looking at these ideas empirically and seeing if they might generate some predictions that are actually testable. Uh, so here are some, some things we might expect if these ideas are actually true. So if music was a target of evolutionary selection, one might expect there to be some universal characteristics of music, because there, if there was some adaptation development to music, then one would expect that to be a starting place for musical cultures to develop. Now, there could still be a lot of diversity, because musical cultures could take that starting place and, and go in a lot of different directions. Um, but nonetheless, that there should be some shared characteristics, some background, backbone that you can find if you dig deep enough. And second, one would expect that musical competence would be relatively widespread and to occur without training. Um, this might seem kind of like an odd idea, because especially in the West, we, we seem to think of music as something that only experts do, uh, and then everyone else uh, is sort of at a remove from those experts to do their musical things. Um, but actually, uh, there have been a number of studies showing that people, people do have musical instincts that are surprisingly sophisticated, so uh, people have expectations about what chord is going to come next. Uh, that uh, are in accord with music theory, for example. Um, and so when I speak about musical competence, it's more as a listener or maybe a performer of very simple songs, uh, as opposed to an expert musician. Now, th this would be very different than the case of reading, for example, because if you passively, passively expose a child to print and then also to speech, um, they're not going to successfully grasp what print actually means. So reading is something that children really do have to be taught. And even as they are explicitly taught over years, it's something that children still struggle with. Uh, so the question is, is music more like that, or is it more like speech, which children will sort of pick up on their own? And secondly, if music did evolve from language, or vice versa, if there's some sort of evolutionary relationship between the two, um, one might expect a couple of things. First, you might expect similar acoustic patterns in language and music. They might uh, share some basic similarities in their sound patterns. And second, you might expect there to be overlapping mechanisms, either in a psychological sense or a neural sense, or both, processing certain features in language and music. So these are the predictions that I'm going to be going over in the rest of the talk. All right, so first, addressing this question of potential <coughs> musical universals. Uh, as I say, this has not been really a very popular idea, and for kind of a very obvious reason. If you listen to the music of different cultures, they seem incredibly different. Um, music just takes, takes this huge, um, surprising variety of forms. And one way to see this is by looking at the gold record, which was included on the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft. Um, so a record is an odd thing to include on a spacecraft, gold or not. So why was this there in the first place? Um, 
Well, these spacecrafts were the first man-made objects that humans were sending out of the solar system. Uh, so there was this sort of wild idea at the time that there's this very, very, very small chance, uh, essentially, that aliens might fly in the spacecraft. And so just based on that very small chance, the researchers included with the spacecraft certain artifacts that were meant to give these very hypothetical aliens some idea of what human culture was like. Uh, and there were a lot of different artifacts meant to give a, um, pictures of, of different aspects of human culture. And one of the artifacts was this gold record, which had samples of music from around the world. So the intent at the time was to capture as wide as possible a picture of the diversity of human music. So as listeners, we can use that to get an idea ourselves of uh, what the diversity might be, so which we're playing, playing the aliens right now briefly. So for example, uh, here is what music from New Guinea sounds like. <laughs> Okay, and here's a Zaire, which is uh, quite different. And Senegal. sounds of Earth, and uh, really you'd be hard-pressed if you had to say, like, what do those all have in common? Even just going from those four examples, um, you'd be hard-pressed to come up with any uh, particular characteristics which have to be there, which are there in, uh, in everything I've played for you. Um, so, based on that variability, the search for universals might seem like something of a foolish prospect, but nonetheless, people have uh, recently been doing this, and um, they have found some things, they haven't found any absolute universals. So there's nothing that has to be present uh, for, for, for something um, uh, in any particular musical culture. But they have found more statistical universals. So these are things that if you look across cultures, more often than not, tend to come up. Uh, so they're neither necessary nor sufficient for something to be music, uh, they just tend to be there. And these are things like uh, the fact that scales are made up of discrete pitches. So if you sample a bunch of musical cultures, more often than not, they'll only use a relatively confined set of pitches, uh, and they'll have a few different scales to choose from. Uh, or for example, the existence of a steady metronomic beat, or this is a pulse that recurs uh, at a very regular, predictable time. Uh, this is something, interestingly, that's not found in language. So people have this intuition that speech is rhythmic in some way, but that rhythmicity doesn't seem to be metronomic in the same way. Uh, and you can't predict, uh, researchers you know, looking at speech have not found a way to actually predict with exact regularity when the next you know, stress syllable or beat is coming. So language really doesn't work this way, but music more often than not does. Another regularity is that there tends to be an alteration of stronger and weaker notes or beats and these tend to alternate, so there don't tend to be several strong beats together and then several weak beats, but uh, the strong beats tend to be separated by weak beats. And the pitch contours underneath phrases tend to follow a certain pattern, which is a kind of descending arch. So they briefly go up at the very beginning, and then they descend for a while, and then they go down even faster at the very end. And finally, the ends of phrases uh, not in addition to being marked by this decline in pitch, are also marked by a sort of slowing down. So the result being that the last note or two of a phrase tend to be longer than the notes that precede it. Okay, so there, there are these statistical universals. There do thing, seem to be things that music has in common around the world. Um, but are these patterns music specific? Uh, because to be the target of evolution for music, they would have to be specific to music. Uh, as opposed to potentially being the consequence of more general motor or <coughs> cognitive or perceptual constraints that all humans share. Uh, so to answer this question, we can compare music to another human communication system, which uh, is language. 
Okay, so why compare music and language? Uh, we're used to thinking of those as two very different things. Uh, are they really similar enough to even compare? Well, actually, so they are quite different in a lot of ways, but compared to other animal communication systems, they're surprisingly similar, and they share certain aspects that are very rare among animal communication systems. <laughs> Uh, so they're made up of discrete, separable sounds, uh, and that in itself is not necessarily rare. But what's more rare is that those sounds are combined using rules to form infinite possible sequences. And this is extremely rare. There's really only a couple of other animals where you can point, point to something like this. Like, uh, there are a couple of birdsong species, for example, uh, that have this property as well. Um, and not only that, but these rules combined to form hierarchical syntactic structures. That means they form these complex rule-based structures that operate on multiple levels, uh, multiple time levels simultaneously. Uh, and this is a property that is even more rare across communication systems. So in comparing speech and music, I'll be talking a lot about acoustic patterns in speech. Uh, they're not talked about as often as uh, as you'll hear about something like individual speech sounds. So I'm just going to spend a little time talking about prosody in speech and what it is and how it works. So when you think of speech, um, often what you think of is probably something like, well, if I want to say the word cat, I think about the word cat in my head, and I think about the fact that it's composed of three main speech sounds, a and t, and then I put those together and I say cat, and then the person listening to me and kind of hear those, hears those speech sounds, figures out what they are, and then assembles the word in their head. Um, and something roughly like that does take place, although it's a you know, hundred times more complicated. Um, but the, so that's the kind of segmental process. So there are these little speech sound segments, and you assemble them, and you put them together to make a word. Um, and uh, that's often what people fixate on when they think about speech. But there's something else going on, too. There are these patterns that extend across multiple segments, across words and phrases and sentences, uh, that are called prosodic patterns. And those are often spoken of, even by linguists, uh, who are not the most poetic people in the world. They're often spoken of in terms of uh, metaphors that come from music. They're, it's, they're, it's talked about as speech melody or uh, speech rhythm. So here's some examples of how that works. So for example, let's take the words, I'm sorry. Um, so if, if you read that just by itself on a page, you would get an idea of what that means. But when you hear someone say it, you have a lot of other information about what they might, might mean based on the rhythm with which they produce the words and the pitch with which they produce the words. Um, so, for example, let's say I'm on the tube and someone runs into me and I'm irritated, uh, but I don't want to directly uh, be confrontational. I might say something like, I'm sorry, where what I mean is obviously not, I'm sorry, but you're a jerk and you should be sorry, uh, and I'm being sarcastic. But let's say I run into them and I'm completely mortified and I want to communicate that very sincerely to them, I would say something like, I'm sorry. So what distinguishes these two ways of saying this is the direction of the pitch. So in the first sarcastic case, uh, I'm using a rising pitch. And in the second sincere case, I'm using a falling pitch. So one of the things you can do with prosody is by changing the direction of the pitch in what you're saying, uh, you can change the meaning of what you're saying. And this is also part of what distinguishes a question from a statement, for example. Something else prosody can be used for is it can be used to mark structural elements. Uh, so here's an example of that. These are, again, in terms of their words, identical statements. No dogs are here. But they're being said here in two very different ways. And there are two main things being altered here. One is the length of the pause between no and dogs. And the second is whether there is a pitch jump between no and dogs. So in the case where there's a longer pause and a pitch jump, that suggests that there is a major structural break here. Uh, in this case, the end of the sentence. And so that would sound like, no, dogs are here. Uh, and that means that there is a dog present. And you can probably stick around and pet them. Um, in the case where there's no pause and there's no pitch jump, that would be no dogs are here, meaning that there aren't dogs present. Um, so my point here is that there are these patterns of pitch and rhythm present in speech that you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, but they are there and they convey a lot of information to you. And uh, we can look at whether or not these patterns of pitch and duration might be similar in some ways to what happens in music. Okay, so let's look at some of these regularities you find across musical cultures and compare them to what happens in speech. So again, in music, we tend to get this alternation between strong and weak beats. And if you read music theorists writing about rhythm in music, you'll see things like this. Um, so what's being shown here uh, on the y-axis here is a, uh, a theory of how strong a particular beat would sound. Uh, and then this is a musical score, a few measures. Uh, and you'll see not only is there an alteration between stronger and weaker elements, 
Um, but that also happens on multiple time scales simultaneously. Um, so within a measure, uh, notes that are next to each other tend to go strong, weak, strong, weak, etc. Uh, but also stronger measures tend to be followed by weaker measures, and so on. Um, now actually, when you read linguists talking about more or less the same phenomenon in speech, they call it something else, they call it stress, but it's still uh, looking at whether elements are strong or weak, uh, you see something very similar, though the notation and the terminology are quite different because music theorists and linguists don't talk to one another. Um, but, so you find stress at the level of individual words, so for example in the word requirement, acquire is stronger than re and meant. Uh, and then you also have something um, similar to the level of the entire phrase. So depending on how I say the boarding phrase law degree requirement changes, I can mean slightly different things. So I can say law degree requirement changes, where I'm emphasizing law, or law degree requirement changes, where for whatever reason I'm emphasizing changes. Um, so actually, in, in terms of how they're talked about by theorists in the two domains, uh, stress in speech and stronger and weaker beats in music actually look quite similar. All right, so the second pattern I'll be comparing to speech is this melodic arch that you find. Again, this is something you find in the phrases in the song that tend to mark the beginning and ends of the phrases, where there is a sharp increase in pitch at the beginning, and then it gradually declines, and then it drops even more sharply at the very end. Um, and actually, if you look uh, across several different languages in speech, you find something that looks quite similar, where again, there's this initial increase, a steady decline, and then an even sharper decline at the end. Uh, and finally, this pattern of final lengthening that you find in song, where basically there's this slowing at the end of the phrase in addition to the drop in pitch, you also find something similar in speech as well. So, um, so at this point, uh, a large number of these regularities that we found across music are not actually specific to music, but they seem to be more general tendencies, um, either of human communication systems or just of humans producing sounds in a sequence. It's hard to say which at this point. Okay, so, so what do we have left after we take out these commonalities that are shared between both music and speech? Uh, well, at least in terms of the acoustics, there's sort of surprisingly little. You basically have two things. You have the fact that scales are made out of discrete pitches, um, and you have the metronomic beat, uh, which again is not really found in language. And really, even the fact that scales are made up out of discrete pitches, if you start thinking of tone languages, uh, where pitch is actually a way in which these sounds can be contrasted, um, contrasted with one another, uh, then, then that sort of goes away as well. And all you're left with is a steady beat, which, which hardly really sounds, seems like enough by itself. All right, so, um, so briefly, I've been talking about similarities between music and speech in these sort of universal regularities you can find across cultures, but you can also find interesting similarities within a single language as well. And that's been looked at by comparing speech rhythm to a musical <coughs> rhythm using something called the normalized pairwise variability index, um, which is an extremely jargony term uh, used to describe something that's actually incredibly simple. Um, so basically, it's just taking two adjacent elements, looking at their duration, and seeing how different they are, and then doing that with every pair of adjacent elements across the whole sequence. So that's all the, the NPVI, or normalized pairwise variability index, um, that's all it is. So this has been a popular tool in speech research to take languages and look at their rhythmic characteristics. Uh, so for example, English has a very high NPVI, and that's because in English there tends to be this alternation between longer and shorter elements. And so English kind of sounds like do -do 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 -do. Uh, whereas French, the MP NPVI tends to be lower, and pairs of syllables tend to have the same direct duration, uh, and so French tends to sound more like do 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 do. Um, so there was a study from 2003 where researchers decided to actually use this exact same tool to look at musical passages uh, from composers who are either English or French, or French who grew up in England and France, surrounded by their native language. Um, so again, English speech higher in PBI, um, more rhythmic alternation, French speech, uh, more rhythmically consistent, lower in PBI. Uh, and they found the same thing in English music and in French music. So English music, just like English speech, tends to sound more like and French music tends to sound more like Okay, so my point with all this is really just to, to set up this, this somewhat counterintuitive idea that even though intuitively when you hear them they sound very different, if you actually look at the sounds, uh, speech and song are very similar acoustically. Um, 
And that's why they're so similar, in fact, that under certain circumstances, you can actually get people to hear speech as song without altering the speech itself. Um, so my first examples of that phenomenon, before I finally get to the actual speech song illusion, are from uh, composers and musicians who noticed this phenomenon uh, first, actually before scientists, and started playing around with it. So um, here is one early example of this. Uh, this is from the Steve Reich piece, Different Trains. Uh, and what he did was he took clips of speech and put them in a musical context to bring out their uh, musical nature. So this is what that sounds like. Highbrow example of a, uh, an interview with Sarah Palin, where a jazz pianist has uh, has is bringing out the sort of uh, inner jazziness in uh, in Sarah Palin. Allow them to spend more and put more money into the economy instead of helping these big financial institutions that played a, a role in creating this mess. That's why I say I, like every American I've seen, would want to know about this position that we have been put in, where it is the taxpayers looking to bail out. But ultimately, what the bailout does is help those who are concerned about the health care reform that is needed to help shore our economy, um, helping the... Oh. Okay, um, so actually it turns out though that you don't even need the musical context. In some cases, actually all you need to do to bring out the musical characteristics of speech is just take it out of its original context and repeat it. Um, and that's it. So this is a phenomenon that was first discovered by Diana Deutsch. Uh, she published it in a CD she released in 2003. She's a, a psychologist who pioneered the field of the psychology of music. Uh, and the first paper she published on the phenomenon was in uh, 2011. So she first discovered this phenomenon when she was recording a CD of auditory illusions, and she was going over some of the text she had made for the CD to check it for sort of acoustic flaws, clicks and pops, and that kind of thing. So she was looping one of the phrases, uh, and she found her surprise that that phrase, at some point, as she was repeating it, started to sound uh, suddenly as if it was being sung instead of spoken. Uh, so I'm just going to play you that example. So first I'm going to play the whole passage. Now I'm going to take the clip out of the passage, and then I'm going to repeat it uh, a large number of times, uh, and then just kind of listen to it and uh, think about what you hear. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 All right, so uh, one of the interesting things about this is that then when you go back and you listen to the original passage, uh, at the point at which this clip starts, uh, there does seem to be this sudden transition from speech to song. And the other thing about this is that once you've heard the transition, you can kind of never go back and hear the speech again. So something that's sort of permanently changed uh, about your brains. So here's the original example again. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. All right, so uh, first, before I go on, can, uh, just to read the room, can I get an idea of who actually did hear did it hear it starting to sound more like songs? Just like a show of hands if you heard it. Okay, most people are good. I have this fear that I'll like I'll give I'll give this sort of talk and then no one will have heard it and I'll think I'm crazy. Uh, but it's it's never happened yet. Uh, but uh, hopefully it never will. Um, so one interesting initial finding that Diana reported about this phenomenon uh, was that it do, there does seem to be it's unclear still. And there's a lot of mysteries about this effect, but uh, it does seem that whatever it is happening with the repetition, it has to be repetition seemingly of the exact same sound clip. Uh, 
Uh, so for example, if you just move the pitches of the clip around between repetitions, um, you still get some transformation, but it doesn't work nearly as well. Or if you randomize the order of the syllables, then it doesn't seem to work at all. Uh, so this is obviously a very striking effect, um, but it's also a useful tool that can be used to address uh, a number of these questions that are kind of hard to address otherwise. So, for example, it can be used to, to try to approach this question of what is song uh, from more of an empirical perspective. Uh, so you can ask, what are the minimal characteristics required for speech to be heard as song? Now, because Diana didn't originally produce this attention intending it for it to be heard as song, presumably whatever is requiring it to sound like music uh, is more or less, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the minimal characteristics you need for people to hear music in the first place. Um, another question you can ask is, well, so basically what you're doing is you're taking different people when you're asking them how song-like something that's not song sounds. Uh, and are the characteristics that people are using to make that judgment, uh, how similar are those across people? And is that something that changes with training, or is that something that's um, really quite consistent uh, that you get you know, no matter what someone's musical experience? Um, and the second way that this phenomenon can be used is to look at the mechanisms of song listening. Uh, it can be used to ask the question, what are you actually doing when you perceive a vocalization as song rather than speech? Because since you have this experience of hearing it first as speech and then as song, clearly you're bringing some kind of psychological mechanisms to bear on it. Uh, and it's still very unclear what those are, but this can be used as a tool to try to get at that. So what are some possibilities in terms of what might actually be driving this effect? Like, so what might be special about this phrase that might be causing this to happen? Um, so one possibility is within a syllable, the, the pitch might be relatively flat, because what people tend to report when they hear this is more or less one pitch per syllable. That's a very consistent effect. Um, and maybe in order to do that assignment, maybe the pitch just needs to be relatively flat. Uh, and if, it were, if there was too much pitch movement, maybe it wouldn't be possible to assign a pitch to it. Uh, Another thing people tend to hear is that it has a sort of uh, steady beat. You can kind of tap that sometimes, behave so strangely. Uh, so maybe that's something else that, uh, that needs to be there for this to happen. And then people also tend to hear the pitches as following a particular musical scale. So uh, the question is, is that actually there in the stimulus? And uh, to what extent does it have to be there in the stimulus for people to hear this? So. Um, Unfortunately, it's not really possible to answer these questions with just a single stimulus, because any characteristics of that one stimulus, they might just be a coincidence. Uh, it's going to have a lot of characteristics that are not directly necessary for this to happen. So to really get at these questions, you need enough stimuli to really start being able to build a statistical model of what's going on. Um, so I worked with Diana on doing that, and I, after three months of what I would describe as very intensive listening to audiobooks, I developed a corpus of 24 examples of what I'm going to call illusion stimuli that do give rise to this phenomenon, uh, where if you take them out of context and loop them, they sound like song to most people, uh, and 24 control examples where this does not happen, or at least doesn't happen as much. So um, I'm just going to play a number of those examples to you, and hopefully if the last one didn't work, at least one of these does. I should say, though, that if you don't hear anything, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, there's a lot of variation between people in the extent to which this works, and that's just, that seems to be just sort of natural. So, so don't worry if this doesn't work. I'll worry about that. But you don't need to worry about it. Um, OK, so here's a few of these examples. First, in context. To say nothing of half a dozen other people in the neighborhood in whom I was not in the least interested. And the phrase itself. People in the neighborhood, 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 people in the neighborhood. Okay, here's another example. There was a cold drizzle of rain. The atmosphere was murky. There was a cold drizzle. 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 Here's example number three. We will be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady, but it is probable that when she comes, she may find neither us nor the photograph. When she comes, she may find. 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 All right, and finally. For I think it is far better not to wash linen of the salt in public. 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 
Let another soul in public. All right, so you might have found by the end of that, you could start to maybe try to guess which phrase I was going to pull out. You might, you might have started to be, able, to be able to hear it earlier and earlier. And then you can get an idea of how I felt after doing pretty much nothing but this for three months. But I actually started hearing this. Like, there was a point in which I couldn't turn this off, and I was starting to hear everything this way. And I don't. That was kind of terrifying. But it went away. Um, all right, so, so at this point, you might be wondering, like, well, is this just something that happens? Like, can you take any phrase uh, and just loop it? Um, and have it sound more musical. And I think to some extent that is, that is true. You do get weird transformations when you hear the same thing over and over again. Uh, psychologists have studied this for a long time under different names. Uh, there's a phenomenon called semantic satiation, where if you say a word over and over again, it starts to lose its meaning. It starts, it's not sounding like a word, it starts sounding like something else. Uh, so if you say the word house over and over again, like house, 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 it just starts to sound strange. Um, um, but that's, that's why I found these control stimuli that are spoken by the same speakers, uh, have roughly the same pitch, they're the same duration, they're matched in a lot of ways. Um, but for me at least, they, they don't work nearly as well. So I'll play those as well. The Royal Barge, attended by its gorgeous fleet, took its stately way down the Thames through the wilderness of illuminated boats. Illuminated boats, 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 illuminated boats. So some sort of transformation seems to happen there, but for me, for me at least, it's not nearly as dramatic, and it never really starts to sound like song. Uh, so here's just a couple more examples. Next came yet another baron and another earl in two long gowns of yellow satin, traversed with white satin, and in every bend of white was a bend of crimson satin. Two long gowns of yellow satin, two long gowns of yellow satin, two long gowns of yellow satin. All right, well, I imagine you probably go on, so that's, that's not control examples. Um, but so the first thing I wondered uh, when I put these together was after three months of doing this, like, I started to wonder if I was just crazy. Uh, I hadn't really shown these to anyone else, so I was sort of like, is this, is this just me? Am I just hearing, am I just hearing things? Uh, so the first thing I did was to find, find some pilot subjects and just sort of ask them, like, do you hear this too? Tell me you hear this too. Uh, and um, it turned out that they did. So what I did was I just I played each stimulus eight times. At the end, asked them if it sounded more like speech or more like song. And there's obviously some variability in there. Uh, but on average, for the illusion stimuli, most people said they sounded like song. And for the control stimuli, most people said they sounded like speech. Um, OK, uh, but that's, that's really crude information. So that's what I originally did during this brain engine study that I'll describe later. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on that by getting more detailed uh, ratings from a larger number of people to try to get at both what might be causing this illusion and also to try to start understanding why different people seem to hear this uh, effect differently. So I've been running a web experiment this year where I've uh, just been asking a large number of people uh, to rate these stimuli to try to answer a couple of questions. Um, why does why do some stimuli seem to work better than others? Uh, why do some transform more? Uh, and also, do people differ in how strongly they hear this, and why? So again, I just used the same corpus, and I had people rate each stimulus after each repetition as it repeated eight times. And so far, I've had 133 people do this. Um, I was going to invite you all to do it, but now that you've heard a few of these examples, you're actually contaminated, so you can't do it anymore. I just realized, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so um, here, here uh, is the broadest overview of what I found. Uh, so there actually is a very small increase in the song ratings, even for the control stimuli. But you can see that it's tiny compared to what happens with the illusion stimuli. Uh, but what I was surprised to find is there actually is this initial difference. There's kind of two effects here. Um, there's this uh, initial difference where the illusion stimuli sound more like song, but there's also this large increase. So both of those need explanation. Um, secondly, not everyone hears the illusion in the same way. So this is looking at how big the increase is from the first to the last repetition. Uh, and I'll be talking that, about that over and over again, so let's just agree to call that the transformation effect. So this is the size of the transformation effect for the illusion stimuli and the control stimuli. Uh, and you'll see that everyone that hears the illusion stimuli is getting more song-like, but the extent to which they do so, there's this, this huge variation in that. Um, whereas the control stimuli, basically the distribution's around zero, uh, with a few weird people who uh, are hearing that is getting quite song-like as well. Uh, so luckily, out of these 133 people, I had about 40 people who had absolutely no musical training, and then about 40 people who had uh, at least three years and an average of seven years, which is a fair amount of training. So um, I thought this would really explain a lot of the variability in how strongly people were hearing the effect, um, but it doesn't really have that 
that much of an effect. I mean, but there's this slight tendency uh, for, for the transformation effect to be larger than the musicians, but it's, it's really quite subtle. And then if you look uh, at, if you sort of average all the musician ratings for each stimulus, and then average all the non-musician ratings uh, in terms of how large the transformation effect is, they're really incredibly, uh, incredibly similar. Uh, so it seems like people's perception of this effect, although people are varying, uh, it doesn't seem to have really much at all to do with musical training, which for me is quite surprising. So the second thing I wanted to do with this data set is look to see why some stimuli seem to be showing this effect more than others. And uh, so what I tried to do was predict the size of the transformation effect using a few different characteristics of the stimuli. Uh, in particular, I looked at five different characteristics, and I'm going to go through them one by once. First, say what the characteristic is, and then talk about uh, to what extent it actually seemed to relate to how people heard them. So the first is the uh, pitch flatness within a syllable. Um, and to give you an intuitive idea, here's the pitch in that people in the neighborhood clip. Uh, there's, you know, not all of them are relatively flat. There's some not flat pitches in there and some relatively flat ones. So again, the idea is that maybe it needs to be relatively flat for you to be willing to assign a pitch to it. Um, but that doesn't really seem to, to be much of a factor. It's kind of, it's significant, but uh, it's, um, it's not that strong of an effect. The second idea I had was, well, um, people do tend to hear scales when they hear these things, and so maybe the pictures, pitches actually fit scales. Uh, and there's a, so I looked at how well each sequence of pitches um, fits an actual musical scale, and that's by, by averaging the pitch for the syllable. Uh, and again, there's a relationship, but it's, it's not terribly compelling. So what did come out is um, more of a factor, is a much simpler factor, which is just the average jump between pitches, just the size of pitch intervals. So it seems that if that's over a certain size, uh, then the kind of structure of intervals do, do doesn't really have the characteristics of a, a musical melody, and people aren't really willing to assign uh, a melodic percept, a melodic perception to it. I also looked at the variability between beats. So one impression that people have of these is that they kind of uh, the illusion ones are more rhythmic, and I tried to find a way to quantify that. Uh, and so what I used is a, an automated computer-based model of where beats are in music. I basically just took that and I applied it to the speech, um, tweaking a couple of parameter, uh, parameters. And it works surprisingly well. So here's one example of just one of the phrases, and there's a, a beep track overlaid on top of it where the computer said the beats were. There was a cold drizzle. There was a cold drizzle. There was a cold drizzle. And uh, then I just looked at the variability of the times between beats to see if they were steady or if, uh, if they were kind of variable or jittered. Uh, this is again something that uh, seemed to predict pretty well the size of the transformation effect. Um, and finally, something else that seemed to matter was just the, the pitch strength underlying each syllable. So uh, when, when someone produces a syllable, they can produce it in a few different ways, either a manner which is strongly pitched, like I'm trying to do now, uh, or uh, in some cases, people might kind of slip into more of a breathy mode or a creaky mode where the pitch uh, is being emphasized. And this seemed to be related, again, to how strongly people were the illusion. So, if you take all these factors and you put them together, it turns out that even though neither of them is doing a fantastic job on their own, they all provide independent variance. So if you use that model to predict the size of the transformation effects, uh, you actually can do a surprisingly good job. So this is the predicted change on the y-axis and the actual change on the x-axis, and it predicts actually 66% of the variance in whether people hear the effect, uh, which, is, which is actually quite good. So just these, these very kind of simple characteristics do seem to be uh, what people are latching onto. Now, as I said, there are two effects to explain. There's this initial difference before the repetition happens, and there's also the transformation effect after repetition. Uh, and so I also looked at whether the factors that determine the initial difference are different than the factors that determine the change, uh, and actually they were. So after just one repetition, people seem to only be listening for beat variability. This is the kind of strength of the relationship, and these are the five different measures. Uh, and the other factors didn't seem to matter as much. But again, after repetition, beat variability was not as important, and these more pitch-based factors uh, seem to be more important. So rhythm seems to be something you can get immediately, whereas using pitch to, to build up the um, idea of the melody in it seems to be something that takes time. Maybe this is why the repetition needs to happen in the first place. And again, we can compare musicians and non-musicians and see whether they seem to be relying on the same factors. And I would say they seem to be relying on almost the exact same factors. So again, after one repetition, 
Um, the biggest factor is beat variability. But again, after more repetitions, these pitch factors come out. So it doesn't really seem that musicians uh, have any, there's any difference related to their training in terms of how they're judging whether something sounds like song. They're behaving almost exactly like non-musicians. All right, so, so now we can put these results together uh, and ask, what is song acoustically? Uh, so to go back to this very vague question I started out with and see if we can actually uh, see what listeners, at least, um, how they see the judgment of something like song. Well, it seems like for people, speech is just, uh, a song is just speech with a few things bolted on, basically. It's just speech that has a regular beat, uh, and then a couple of other things, relatively flat pitches, small intervals, but just a few very simple acoustic characteristics, really. And now musicians and musicians seem to weight these characteristics um, in very similar ways when deciding how musical speech is. So the other thing that we can do with this phenomenon is to ask, what is song perception? Uh, so what happens when you perceive a vocalization as song rather than speech? So again, when you hear this illusion, you get the impression that you sort of switch to the song listening mode. And maybe we can use this to try to figure out what that mode actually is. And uh, some initial ideas that I came up with um, more by introspection than anything else. Um, people's impression is that uh, the, the pitch of these examples is sort of suddenly much more tension grabbing or salient. You can kind of say exactly what it is. Uh, whereas normally when you hear someone talk, you get the idea that it's going up and down, but you can't really say much more than that. So maybe that's going on. Um, it's possible that maybe the speech information is becoming less important. So maybe that's being kind of downregulated. And maybe there's an increased tendency to move or swing along. So some of these examples, especially people in the neighborhood, I find that I, I kind of, uh, it's hard for me not to sort of tap along to them, or they sort of start to repeat them in my head. And maybe that's also going on. So um, I tried to look at that using fMRI uh, to look at what happens when you perceive speech as song. Again, just using these two groups of stimuli uh, and repeating each stimulus eight times and looking at the neural correlates of perceiving the one versus the other. In this case, the participants were relatively musically sophisticated, so just keep that in mind. It's possible that non-musicians would not behave in the same way. And I have three different hypotheses, and I'm going to try to give you an idea of where you would expect those to show up in the brain, so that when I show you the actual data, it's not just a bunch of colored blobs to you. Um, so again, I have this idea that maybe pitch salience was increasing when you hear the illusion, uh, and that would be theoretically linked to an increase in the parts of the brain that have been shown to care about pitch. Uh, and luckily, those are in a very specific place, and uh, so, so this is obviously a brain, and uh, this little red thing here that kind of sticks back um, from the temporal lobe, which is here, that is called Heschel's gyrus, and that's the location of what's called the primary auditory cortex, which is sort of a major uh, early auditory area. Now just in front of that, there's this little, this little uh, blob of areas uh, that have been shown in a bunch of studies to care about pitch. So if you play them something very pitchy, compare that to something it's not very pitchy, uh, then you tend to get activation in this area here. So that was one hypothesis. Um, the other two hypotheses had to do with motor areas, because again, I had this idea that I had this impression that at least I, when I hear these, have this tendency to kind of um, to sing along with them in my head or repeat them uh, to myself more than to the other examples. So what might be expected if that's true? Well, uh, there are motor areas in the brain, so that's kind of an obvious, an obvious choice. In particular, primary motor cortex is on this and you, can, you can look for this sort of diagonal strip that kind of divides frontal cortex, which is here, from parietal cortex, which is here. Um, now, in particular, we might actually expect maybe specifically mouth cortex, uh, and that can be found just sort of lower down, closer to the temporal lobe. Uh, so sort of look, look down here for these areas. And finally, we might expect auditory motor areas. So these have been uh, found to be important for building a bridge between auditory information and motor planning. So, uh, for example, if you have someone talk and then you alter the feedback that they're getting from what they're saying so that it's wrong and then they'll try to correct it based on that, then you get activation in this sort of area. Uh, and this is the, the junction between the temporal lobe, which is here, and the parietal lobe, which is here. Um, so I found a few things. I'm going to focus on the ones that I've predicted here, uh, and so I'll be showing those. Uh, to you. So basically what I find, found is that there were a number of areas that were more activated for the illusion stimuli than the control stimuli, and interestingly no areas where the opposite was true. So the speech uh, perception did not seem to turn on anything additional compared to song perception. And what I found uh, was in line with my predictions. So uh, I found what seemed to be pitch-related areas uh, here, for example, 
and then this auditory motor integration here we have here. And then also, well here you can see that pitch area show up again, uh, but also what seem to be these mouth motor regions here, uh, and what also is relatively close to the hand regions, maybe people were actually sort of tap, um, tapping along. Now people weren't actually moving in the scanner, so this would be imagined movement, but it's been shown in other studies that imagined movement also causes activation in these areas. Okay, so um, to, to wrap this bit up, what is song perceptually then? Uh, what can we say about that? Well, it seems to be, again, speech with a few bits added. Uh, it seems to be basically your basic speech processing areas, but with a little extra pitch processing uh, and some imagined movement, which probably has something uh, to do with beat perception. And interestingly, there's no evidence for downregulation of speech processing. So speech perception uh, does not seem to actually go away when you hear a song. A song is kind of added on top of it. All right, so uh, with this data in mind, let's return to this question I opened with and speculate wildly about it. Uh, so um, there is growing evidence for deep connections between speech and music. So this very old idea that was kind of abandoned in the literature for a very long time uh, actually now is, is leading to testable predictions and real data. Uh, so this, this was, um, in a lot of ways, very prescient of, uh, of Darwin. And that's been found both acoustically and psychologically. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know for sure, but maybe, maybe one really did evolve from one another, and maybe they do share this deep uh, relationship in evolutionary history. Um, now, granted, whatever happened took place 40,000 years ago, so the, the, the bodies are very cold at this point. Um, we'll probably never know for sure exactly what happened, and that's sort of why there are these endless debates about these topics. You can never really have the right data to know for sure. Um, hey, but let's speculate. Uh, you know, it's kind of a pop science to talk, so uh, so let's just go ahead and do it. So, um, so you know, based on what I've been talking about, if there is some evolutionary relationship between speech and music, do we side with Darwin um, or with Spencer? So, so which which facial hair do we want to go with here? Um, well, so this again, this is wild speculation, but you know, very limited evidence based on this one bone flute um, suggests that music appeared more recently than speech. Uh, so, so let's say that's true. Um, and also, based on these couple of studies that I've been talking about, song perception does look like speech perception with extra bits added, uh, which suggests that maybe if one evolved from another, if I had to put money, money on it one way or another, um, you know, maybe music did evolve uh, from speech by, by focusing in on these prosodic elements of speech and kind of abstracting those and, and turning those into an art form uh, by itself. Okay, so I, I had a little more, that, that is pretty much my time and I don't want to run over. So I think I'm just gonna stop uh, here and first thank my collaborators. So this work was done with uh, a few people in the States, uh, Ani Patel, Diana Deutsch, and, um, and Mara Green. So I'd like to thank them. Uh, and also, uh, here at Birthback, this was done with Fred Dick and Marty Serena. So all, all of their help was invaluable, and none of this would have got, got done without them. So I'd like to thank them, and I'm uh, happy to respond to questions if people have. Questions for Adam? When you were saying about like uh, English and French in terms of the way they're speaking, it comes out in the music. Uh, I was just wondering that while well, they're, they're both uh, Western uh, Western languages and they're the most major minor and melodic minor, and the uh, the folk, if I'm right, the folk music tends to be more mobile. I was thinking of if you thought about. Uh, in terms of Middle Eastern and, and uh, Indian and Japanese scales, in terms of the way they speak in terms of the music. Hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so that stuff has made me, th so the stuff about um, speech and musical rhythm being similar within a language, that's, to my knowledge, only been done in European languages. Um, the stuff I was showing on that, that uh, arched descending pitch contour, uh, there we have been trying to do it cross-culturally. Um, so, so I, I should say, I, I've been personally involved in this research on uh, this, on pitch contours across musical cultures, uh, and, and I, I wasn't the one who did the stuff on speech and musical rhythm. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the, the pitch contour stuff, we are, we have been trying to look across more globally, and in a follow-up we're doing now, we've explicitly looked at Western cultures by themselves and non-Western cultures by themselves, just looking at recordings of vocal, solo vocal music. And we found really the exact same pattern in, um, 
both in non-Western and in Western music. So at least that one particular pattern does seem to be very basic. And our hypothesis is that it's just due to, uh, it's something about the breath cycle. So as you, as you sing, there's this kind of buildup in pressure beneath your vocal cords, and it follows this arch that's very similar to the arch that shows up in the pitch contour. And um, physiologists have also shown that all else being equal, the more pressure there is, the kind of easier it's, it is to sing higher pitches. Uh, so if something like that's going on, that would explain why it's so widespread. We actually found the same thing in birds. I didn't have time to go into it, but even birds uh, have the same contour, probably because they also just push it out of their lungs in order to sing. So. What happens when you listen to language that you don't understand? It's no longer, is it speech or is it no, or what is it? Well, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot, this is such a new effect, there's been so little work on it, there's a lot to do, and one thing I would be really interested on in is to look at how people who don't, A, how people who don't speak English hear it. I, mean, I, I am wondering if then they would start to hear the illusion faster, because they might be more focused on the acoustic characteristics of the speech and not the meaning. Uh, and I'd also be really curious how people who speak a tone language, um, how they respond to the phenomenon. I'm wondering if they would, if they would wait pitch-related musical aspects immediately, because maybe they don't need repetition in order to pull that out. Maybe they're so primed to pay attention to pitch that it's just there initially for them. Uh, and so I, I think both of those are questions that uh, are very interesting, that just no one's gotten around to trying yet. Yeah. Yeah, you have any idea how where they will get their source for inspiration for being musical? So I noticed in your first demonstration that the second recording had the music made from the sounds of washing machines. Is it possible that some people in the tribe somewhere 40,000 years ago who had that acuity for sounds who were able to pick up these repetitive and then, you know, like they, you know, like psychologically they made that build, they bridged, made that bridge and then well, yeah, this is, I mean, it's entirely, this is one of the things people have speculated about music. So one of the mysteries about music is where, where does the emotion come from, right? There's this, people have this very deep emotional response to music, but it's not obvious why that should be. I mean, there's, there's nothing intrinsic about these sounds that would seem that should, that should cause emotional response. And so it seems quite bizarre that it happens. So people have suggested that music might be similar to certain acoustic things in the environment that would happen to be emotionally arousing. Uh, either you know, sort of human cries or, or, or animal noises or that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, um, ask, sort of addressing your question about evolution, Darwin actually suggests that about human speech, that it might have, um, in its fairly early days, kind of started out as imitation of noises from the environment, and that might have turned into something more systematic. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of these things that it happened 40,000 years ago, so, so really, who can say? So you can kind of, there's a lot of stories that fit our incredibly small amount of data. But you know, it, it's certainly possible. <coughs> if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Adam very much for a fascinating talk.